Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. I would like to speak about life's arrow from the bow of space. And so how we consider space not having an origin, but we consider what's in the space to have an origin. In this episode, I'm kind of wondering, <clears throat> not kind of what I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering how, in some sense, life, which is identified with manifestation and the movement through the manifest, how in some sense it was shot like a bow, from a bow, you know, like an archery bow. So pretty much the title means how life's direction was shot out of space. We human beings have an advantage that many other species on this planet don't. And that advantage brings with itself a sort of suffering, but it also brings with itself a sort of greater access. You see, animals are not stressed. They are not depressed. They don't suffer. They are like, uh, not that they don't suffer. I mean, in the moment they do, but they don't keep the suffering in, alive in their mind. The human being, the homo sapien, has a very unique ability to, in some sense, look at the world and notice its limits. So I would define human existence is to know your limits. You are here as a being to know the limits of how you are, in some sense, prior to description, prior to shape, energy conscious of itself unspeakable. Now, let us consider that with this ability to notice that life ends, to have a sort of comparative value system of yesterday to today, for example, our consciousness makes us suffer, but it also makes us do things that the, many in the animal kingdom cannot. The human kingdom can do much, you know, has, has an, an extraordinary ability. That means if you compare yourself to other creatures, you're way ahead. <clears throat> but if you can compare yourself to a field of mind, you could be behind. You know, there's this archer in Persian mythology. His name is Arash the Kamangi. <clears throat> this mythological archer, in some sense, the, this archer of myth, he was known in Ford Ferdowsi's poetry, and this poet's poetry, most myth mythologies arise from poetry. He had written as if this archer t took a, in some sense, held the bow back and took a shot, let go of the arrow, 
that when the arrow hit the opponent, it was as if the opponent never existed. Literally, the poet used that kind of language. And it's kind of fascinating because life is like this momentum forward and at its fruition, when it really makes the final impact, it is not, it is as if you had never existed, you know? It's like while you exist, it, it's like right now, we're not defending the rights of people who are dead, right? People know, so many people don't care about those who have passed away, you know? And I'm not talking about like virtual rights or digital rights, I'm talking about the, their freedom. We don't, we don't defend the freedom of the non-existential. Like right now, <clears throat> um, if I, like I don't have kids right now, but I can't defend the son I don't have. You know what I mean? <laughs> like for example, <clears throat> I'm saying that it's like when something is not there, you can't do much. And there comes a state of mind in the human experience. I think at some point, for most people, it should hit them by 30. And it is in some sense a full confrontation of the inevitable and the unknown. And here's a little secret. I consider it a secret because I feel it's uncommon. Your fear and your hope and everything you have ever experienced, if you figure out as a human being while you're alive where it comes from, I will tell you, you will be free before you have ever needed to be. It's very difficult. So much of my life is in the habit of existence. And for an existential creature to fathom uh, non-existence, it is as if trying to imagine what deep sleep is like. <clears throat> there is no image. And I feel that we are being drawn towards an inconceivable point in time. This inconceivable point, Terence McKenna spoke about it as a transcendental object. At the end of time. I don't think it's a transcendental object. I think from a different angle, it's literally human beings becoming pure minds. <clears throat> so that transcendental object is the field. Right now, I, I consider, let me tell you what I'm kind of, what my emo, what my heart is seeing. My heart is seeing an objective, uh, individual, subjectively individual creature. That means if, if you, somebody said this, if you, if you took away, stripped away all the names, all the language, all the stories <clears throat> from human beings, they will not have classifications. That means, what would a silent civilization look like? And it will be a civilization where in some sense there is no need to speak because the knowing become, has become instantaneous. Now, I feel this pattern can manifest in two potential ways. Either something dramatic happens and human beings become suddenly super alert to how their intelligence is happening and we discover a sort of ocean behind our eyes which were all drops, or, or in front of our eyes, we will reach this conclusion and rather than from the inner realms, in front of our eyes, it will be a conclusion where we will pretty much connect everybody's head to a server. And that server is going to become the mind, the ultimate mind. <clears throat> so it's very hard to say. I think if we connect our heads, like, I don't know how to really fathom it, but I'm, I'm getting an inkling of like, if we were to connect all our heads, imagine there were 8 billion human beings, but we connected all their heads to a computer or something and they were on the same server. It would kind of be like, these human beings will not have one body. Literally, you will be part of this oceanic mind where you are experiencing all bodies. My fear was that, I mean, I understand Elon Musk is a great man and I will say, go further, Elon. <clears throat> you must, you know. But there is a danger in the sense that I think it's going to fry the brain. I think too much information without having a way to be processed is going to lead to destruction. You know, I found a moment in my life where it was a rare moment and <clears throat> um, I was visiting a friend and I can tell you that um, I had a rare experience in my life where I think Terrence McKenna would be proud of me. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
I would say that uh, in that experience, I had an overload. I had an overload of information and I literally had to put my palm on my forehead and there was a sort of calming down. You see, it's not just about how you receive information. The impact, information has an impact when it hits you. If it's coming from a source that the nature of your being feels honest, you will suddenly feel uh, a crack in the illusion of the habitual uh, persona. <clears throat> so guys, I'm looking at the chat section. Jesse says, a social memory complex we would be a social memory complex. How are you using the word complex? Do you, are you saying that we would be in some sense uh, a sort of pattern of behavior or a sort of approach? I'm not really sure how, um, how, how you're meaning it or you just mean it's going to be, it's going to be like this co complex kind of, it wouldn't be memory. It would be world. It would. I think at that point, if we connected eight billion heads, like literally to a server, literally, it would mean like they would have a cyberspace existence, and they would either experience the information of the internet gradually, <clears throat> like as if like it's in a hidden world, you know. Like what that means. Imagine we create this technology that makes the whole in every information in the internet suddenly look like a landscape, a city, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I thought you meant that. Okay. Yeah, it would be a sort of social memory complex, I guess, Jesse. It would be, um, it wouldn't be social anymore. The concept of social will cease to exist if it's one mind, actually. Yeah, hive mind, I like that word better. The hives, yeah, the hive mind. Technically, it's uh, that, that, you know what that means? That means right now, us experiencing ourselves as individuals, we're going to feel more real, the collective. So, technically, individuality will feel more unreal. Imagine we go into that kind of group mind, or Jesse, as you suggest, hive mind. This sort of hive mind, imagine we go through it and for eons it's hive mind, hive mind, hive mind, then comes the rebellion to come back to individual consciousness. <clears throat> there was something that it was in Sufi wisdom and for a long time I wondered why, but I found a sort of neat explanation of it. There was this saying in Sufi tradition where they would say the Sufi, the dervish, would be grateful for everything the, the, uh, the being was given, but also grateful for what was not given to it. It was a strange saying. Usually you're like, you know, people get disappointed when they don't get something. But, you know, this this tradition is this, this approach. The Sufi mindset is saying, like, there's something more. So <clears throat> it's a game of your self with your own world self in some sense. The Sufi said it's important to be grateful for all types of moments, whatever they are. You know, that means if you don't get something, if you get something. And I was thinking, why? And then I realized, guys, it's all just a counter-cultural reaction. <clears throat> and this counter-cultural reaction is making history spiral. So if history had, history is not a straight line. Time may be seen as a straight line, but history is a spiral, guys. <clears throat> and it's a spiral towards more consciousness of complexity. In this book I wrote, it, 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 I mean, honestly, it's a book that wrote itself, really. <laughs> but it's called The Great Work, and it's one of those mysterious things that for now I've, I've, a lot, I've just let it be online, but probably I'm going to take it off or something, because it was written in a different state of mind. <clears throat> but anyways... In it, there's the last chapter of it, there's this concept called the web of Enos, I-N-A-S, right? And this web of uh, uh, Inus, let's say, <laughs> this, this uh, I saw existence as a complexity. I saw that space and time are not just space and time. There is an intelligence here. It's just that this intelligence first feels... Uh, conditional because it's we're attributing it, ascribing it to the body, but then this intelligence will inevitably discover itself as just witness. Because we are such creatures as uh, of objective form, subjective form, anything outside of that would freak us out. 
I'm going to share with you guys uh, this um, science fiction kind of the novel's not finished, but I'm going to I'm going to share with you the story because <clears throat> why not? I've written this novel and I call it an alien named language, an alien called language, something like that. An a I think it was an alien called language, an alien called language. Take that in. And I think I said it in the year 2000, I don't know what year I said it, but I think it was like a 200 years ahead of, time, ahead of now. And pretty much I had created a world setting in many of my science fiction works. Uh, I tried to find, wonder about deviations of the earth, you know. <clears throat> so in this parallel reality, human beings, the earth is completely black you know, like like burned out, like charcoal, like coal, and human beings are living in these sky cities that are magnetic powered, so technically they can't even fly from them, you know, they're just living above their orbit, <clears throat> and they have some sort of advanced nanotechnology, food creation technology, so that's how they have their resources, you know, they 3D print their food pretty much, <clears throat> but in this society, they're all in sky cities, and the admin, the administer, like let's say the, the the I've created, I've infused the concept of a general and a king. So these sky cities, who's running them, is this general dash king. Literally, he's sitting in a in a king's throne room. Everything's kingly. He has a crown on his head, but he's in military uniform, in a sort of unique military uniform. All his councilmen are like dressed like military men, but he's sitting on a king's throne in the sky city. He's the king, the general like the manager of all the sky cities of earth, right? And so the civilization made some mistakes and these are the last human beings. And of course, but these, this human, humanity is overpopulating and they're building sky cities. It's like a sky civilization. It's like, it's like as if thinking <clears throat> the earth, there were all the castles on earth that got destroyed except the castle in the sky. It's that kind of like narrative timeline of the earth. And so in this timeline, it, what, is, what is occurring really is that uh, th this general is in his council and his throne kind of room. This alien appears out of nowhere, you know, and the general, you, in, the, in the book, he, I, I write it that he has a son. He has this young son that if this was a movie at the beginning, you just see the young son looking outside the sky city, just coming outside of school and looking at this black earth, do you know? <clears throat> And so now what happens is the general king in his throne room, they're thinking about everything. Now I thought of in a lot of media and narrative, there is this idea that the first extraterrestrial alien contact is violent. Okay? It's violent. We, it's, like, it's like for filmmakers it was easier or maybe more exciting to see aliens fight, human beings fight aliens. But in this novel, I decided to create a setting where it's the first enlightened alien. It's like an enlightened, like a incredibly advanced, but also internally advanced alien. And he's, uh, he's this alien that comes into this um, General King's throne room. He suddenly appears. You can't even see his, what do you call it? His, um, Body. Anyways, guys, what happens is the alien scans all the people in the king's council. The king gets shocked. The alien says, "I've come to enlighten your civilization and teach it to teach the civilization to galactic. Uh, open your civilization's eyes to the galactic." <clears throat> and in that moment, the king suddenly sees something and says, "What do we call you?" And the aliens, literally, this is the scanning part, scans all their minds and says, your species hasn't uh, advanced above language, just call me language. So the alien tells the king, you can call me language, but it's this advanced kind of ethereal form alien. And so this general king suddenly realizes there is the sort of illumination of this like holy moment. It's like a divine moment. And the general run, just says, please teach my son first. The general just says, please teach my son first before you enlighten civilization. And the whole book, and the whole book is how this alien, after this kid comes back from school, in some sense, just has conversations with this kid while walking around the sc like school thing. And the kid asks questions like, 
the, the aliens there and you know the kid says questions like are there any humans on earth and the alien just scans instantly when I say scan it's not a robot okay the alien scans and says there's seven but they are so savage they have become so savage they can't integrate in your societies and so the kid keeps asking questions about what he knows and all this and something and eventually the kid goes gets to a point where he starts asking questions about the alien and that part of the book I've written the skeletal form but I haven't really written it yet that part of the book <clears throat> so anyways guys that was the alien called language kind of a suggestion how there's a mystery to what could be beyond it beyond language and so life's arrow is a linguistic term. Time is, an, is, is a concept. What is a concept? You look at it, it is like the body of an a image. You know, for me, words are like the body of an image, you know, something like that. I feel we're going to become micro-sensitive, and this is the thing. I feel rationality uh, is important, but I feel it is also a phase where intelligence will move into totally different conditions of interpretation. <clears throat> that means you can make the best rational decision when you have all the information, even if you're in a situation where there's unknown variables, even if you make the most rational decision, you might suddenly see the outcome changing differently, you know? Or like in this show, Shingeki no Kyojin, Levi, this captain says to the soldier, main soldier, you know, who's afraid, and he says, listen, nobody knows what happens in the battle. You can trust your comrades, you can trust the strategy, you can trust whatever, but at the end, nobody knows. And so after some point, guys, right now, most people are fascinated for, for their individual life because reality is soft and gentle. That means if literally there was an alien invasion, do you think the species is ready? The species that, that in some sense, you know, <clears throat> uh, complains about its coffee, you know? or complains about a little dirt on its clothing. Like, like I, I'm telling you, we have to uh, push towards something. Here's the nature of life. You move or it moves you. And it's always been like this. And the good thing about you moving is that you become conscious of the world's movement. But if the world moves you, you become kind of pushed by, these, by this tsunami, this unconscious tsunami, you know? <clears throat> so guys Dylan in the chat section says something very interesting he says I've had a snap or vision of myself shooting into a micro cell in my body and it was such a deep with with, with such deep such uh, in my own body okay I see what you're saying you're saying there were deep synapses okay yeah, yeah, it's like attention can suddenly move. That's why I'm saying like whatever relationship the mind comes, it's the whole moment that's occurring, is it not? This is why I've had moments where in my inner realms, even though I've, I've perceived something chaotic, but I realize it's just a part of the moment. And the moment you know this, you know that you're like right now, ask yourself, where is the edge of your mind? Not that, not your brain. I'm not saying your brain, but what, how the brain is processed into the subjective selfhood. In some sense, where's the edge of yourself? In some sense, like if I ask you, who, uh, who are you? You're going to, let's say you write, like you give a sentence answer. Okay, that sentence answer, where is it? Where is all these ideas I'm talking about right now to you? Right now, the sound is the symbolic value, but where is the idea? So understanding is an inner phenomena, but it's an inner phenomena that notices in some sense its relationship with the outer and it, you could, we can never technically see what's outside. We see the reflection of it. And if there is a chance, light hits phenomena. And if, I, I think this is maybe not practical because on some level, science has recently seen light is not a particle like photons, you know? In some sense, light is like a wave. 
<clears throat> that does change the picture and the dynamic, but I'm just saying that it's kind of like, as imagine a light hitting a bunch of mirrors, it's go, some, if something happens, something, so, there is tiny deviate, tiny uh, fluctuations, you know. So in life, it's kind of strange. You can't, uh, you can't do anything without something new being experienced, even if it's a micro movement. I don't want to say you can't do anything, but I'm saying like, What one can do is evoke the new, recognize that there is a tension and the breathing every time the person inhales, exhales, any micro ch change in the moment. It shifts the nature of the whole, the, the whole texture of the moment. That means if you notice your feelings, your emotions, if one becomes really sensitive, they are micro changes before these micro changes appear as macro changes. So I would say emotions are zooming more in on an image. And I don't know, there's something in this life that it's like regardless of your philosophy, when you see, for example, you know, a child, how would I say it? If you see, for example, like, guys, I don't know. I saw a poverty commercial that literally I was having a normal day. I was like, yeah, it seems like a good day. I saw this poverty commercial on TV and it just, I broke. Like, have you ever broken like glass? Whatever value you had of yourself by just seeing a condition in the world right now. I, I, I feel I am in, um, I am speaking in paradise. Because this world can be really cruel. And so what is the human effort? The human effort is that uh, imagine consciousness was beyond the body. So that would technically mean your consciousness. Imagine, uh, again, collective mind or imagine like in Shintoism, they believe every person's body is not just bodies, just all matter is like. Uh, a sort of simultaneous highway for our souls to move in it. So instead of them thinking there's one person, they're thinking as if there is endless souls moving the vessel rather than the vessel being one soul going transmigrating. You know, metaphysics gets really deep, guys, because eventually we are in a universe that's endless. So whatever system of thought, you at some point of expanding it, you get to the unknown and then you're like, then what? You know, so that's, that's what I've realized is that you can jump to the reverse. So when I say you can pilot through your inner realms, it doesn't mean literally you have like you're, you're in a pilot's room. <laughs> I, it, I, I don't mean you're in an airplane. I mean, by piloting, I mean how right now as I'm speaking to you, you are attention. Your attention before you're any ideology. You're just attention, presence of attention. And I think this presence of attention is the instantaneity of consciousness and energy. <clears throat> so, how would I say this? Reality is evolving. It's kind of thinking like if you don't try something, there's going to be endless people in history who are going to come and try it. So life gets some sort of excitement, but then you go see there's this map vast unknown. You know, I, I remember I had kind of created this character. Uh, I don't know why I'm feeling a sci-fi vibe in this episode.
I feel there's incredible things that are going to happen and we're freaking out over the past and making ourselves incapable of acknowledging how the new is being born every day. You know, it's it's really after some point you want to you want to know how human beings in some sense should treat themselves. It's, it's it's like after some point it's just information, are we not? We're just different forms. We're life in different forms technically, you know. <laughs> You know, because that life can't be ascribed individual. Like right now, it's it's conditional, the existence and also the experience is navigating through conditions. But I think there will come the reverse of this relationship. I feel at the moment of physical transition out of this plane of existence, it becomes the opposite. And guys, I'm... Uh, <clears throat> If my if you hear extra noises, it's um, my stomach might you know <laughs> you know might want to talk, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Here's the thing: I I I feel we are this uh, we are eyes that appear in unknown movement. And we are trying to articulate this movement to whatever we can get a hold on. And it's like the first thing we got a hold on was our objective existence. Then we got a hold of our subjective existence. And now where we are left, and that's where I noticed the revolutionary idea that it's like, how does the individual transform into the collective? How? And I will tell you the metamorphosis of a caterpillar is the greatest, what do you call it? The greatest... Um, it's, it's what's happening. We are literally like... Imagine you plant a seed in the soil and imagine the soil to be a dimension. So you've planted a seed in a dimension, but this seed steps out of the soil, pulled by this unknown light and being watered by this unknown source. You know, the seed sprouts. It sprouts in a new dimension. The, the caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly. So there's this constant uh, emergence as phenomena, then the phenomena breaks down, then re-emergence. We, you live as a person a day with certain views and values, you, you, you sleep, literally there's a gap. <laughs> there's this chunk of like, okay, check, like literally you pause the video game, and then you come back to the video game. To, to life's game that's visual. History repeats itself in patterns. So regardless of your gratefulness to the good or the bad, you see just every moment is like, it's like existentially all phenomena is happening at once experientially it's been put into a dual relationship because it's like every person's consciousness is like a candle and it's illuminating a certain range you see the world has made us fear the opposite of what we think we are doing as a species Excuse me. For me, I have found a strange solace in not per se living for the future, but just trying to see a system advance. It's like every person that they have hopes for their own individualism. You know, you're caring for yourself. That means you want to see more of yourself.
it was a wondrous thing for me, you know. Some people sometimes say, I want to experience something for myself. You know, it's like I got to get on that roller coaster ride myself to know really how intense it was. You know, but you are seeing the roller coaster ride. But why still, in some sense, the person pursues to sit and laugh? Like this sentence, I want to experience. It's such a strange sentence because the I is an experience. Your sense of individuality is, is an experience. You know, I don't know how to say it. So I feel intelligence or greater intelligence is that same sort of you want to see more, yet it's kind of like because the system was here before you, I think subconsciously we all acknowledge the, the earth as our elder and we also acknowledge the uh, kind of that it reaches an unfath uh, unfathomable point. That means literally our history could be hollow because language was self-generated. You know, I was th I was thinking it's 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 very fascinating. Here's where we're left with. Let me tell you, I think I know where the world, the global secular society is going to go next. If I have a pen, where's my pen? You know, guys, let's consider it like this. Right now, as you're hearing my voice, you're hearing my voice in what we call reality. <laughs> so we're in reality right now, okay? Now, I want you to think of yourself in a very simple level, no stories, nothing. You're just a creature. And I want you to think of it also with an access to science. Guys, I just wanted to say, here's the deal. Pretty much, I feel it's a very important issue that human beings have always wondered how intensely they need to acknowledge the relevance of that which is not fit, uh, physical and that which is not tangible. Because imagination is visible, but it's not tangible. Like I can imagine one piece of sushi just hovering in the air, but I can't pick up and eat that sushi, but I can acknowledge the design of the inner arms, right? So I'm saying, imagine we kind of are a person where, um, how would I say? I think the secular mind looked at the archaic and said, those stories are meaningless. <clears throat> I feel the secular mind then looked at itself and the, the, uh, the secular mind looked at the archaic, the archaic narratives and in some sense concluded uh, that it is man-made, that and this concept of God is man-made, okay? Now, if the concept of God is man-made, then what is the concept of man? That means if God is man-made, then technically man is also man-made, <clears throat> okay? Now, in a, in a very secular materialistic perspective, technically many neurologists are saying there is no free will, okay? They're saying there's no free will. Now, that what that kind of means is that the person who is denying um, the archaic or saying that the archaic is man-made is also realizing that man 
is conditionally made. So technically free will is conditional and man doesn't exist. So free will is a temporary illusion. So if free will is an illusion, who was doubting, believing or disbelieving in the first place? <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? That means you, because everything is man-made, then it means creativity is the only, le only place left. That means I feel secular society <clears throat> has strangely... Uh, has nowhere to go other than to begin to consider the human being as a purely creative animal with no sort of linear correlation with the historic time that is an arrow. I feel history, guys, it's this grand illusion we're existing in. Enjoy it while we're in it, you know? <laughs> All right, guys, um, I'm going to try something before I haven't tried before. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try something I haven't tried before. And guys, I'm going to play this music. I need the viewers' help to kind of tell me how loud it is. So I don't know if people hear music right now, but they should probably. I think maybe the volume of the music should be less. So, um, can somebody in the chat section let me know if you can hear the music in the background? just been kind of like how the planet is hovering in the middle of nowhere it's like a sphere in a vacuum kind of situation so technically it's all all human knowledge in a vacuum kind of situation <laughs> so what that means is language is a, is, is, a, is a means to an end or let me say it like this language is not us we are not we're not language Guys, now you can get a sense to what I listen to when I give these talks. You know? <clears throat> Let me tell you what it feels like. It feels like at first you're running after the ultimate image. Then you see man is more than an image. Then all the search for ideological systems suddenly become hollow. Then you're left in this preferenceless experience that has no need to even ask the question. So it's like there comes a point where that yearning for for the unknown, uh, in some sense, may shift. <clears throat> may shift in it. There's so much change in life that no opinion has firm footing. Literally, our experience is the storm that moves our attention from <clears throat> from the thoughts of the brain. I feel there is no there's no truth that's like a picture you can hang on the wall. I feel we are going to realize that our minds are moving at speeds that we can't literally communicate. <clears throat> I 
guys, if um, if people want the music off, if, if there's a bunch of people who say yes, I can turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'm just doing it as a sort of kind of like, you know, a sneak peek of kind of like what I'm doing. You know, what I'm listening to. Or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, guys, we were, life has a momentum, that intelli the intelligence of the momentum right now, it's kind of like A, B, C, D, but we're going to eventually tap into the non-linear, so you're going to suddenly realize you knew certain things uh, in your childhood. Let me tell you, like, there's some feeling like a deja vu experience, and there's something that's strange, I don't want to say an inner deja vu, but it's as mysterious as a deja vu that I've experienced, and it's when I... Literally, literally, how would I say it? Like when I, I had this experience that was in my conscious waking state. Then at that moment I had that experience, I realized why in my childhood, in a certain moment, I had certainty. So random, but I saw the correlation. It was as if my future self is standing beside this self and also standing beside the past. Imagine suddenly in front of you, you see two versions of yourself. You see the most past version of yourself and you see the future version of yourself. And you'll notice something, they go to this bright glow of sort of inconceivability. So this is the, uh, the, the grand challenge, what do, when we move beyond the language threshold, what is the teaching, what is the activity, literally what becomes the purpose of life, right? Now if you ask people what the purpose of life is, they're like just get to the next day bro, like that, <laughs> they'll tell you that's the purpose of life, continuing survival. Right? Survival of the fittest. You gotta, you know, continue as long as you can. But I think it's not just continuation. I think <clears throat> intelligence after some point uh, extracts work out of its world. Somebody once told me that human beings, they have a sort of, uh, sort of exchange of value between each other in any sort of communication. Usually with every person, it's like, another exciting kind of it's like how would I tell you it's it's like Sorry guys, I'm just going to turn off the music. It's I think it's distracting. Maybe. I don't know, I'm constantly drawn towards the inconceivable. That experience of that kind of inner deja vu or whatever, it was just noticing... Uh, I kind of noticed I the knowing I had in my past was not separated. It's as if you have a memory, but it's it's literally the same ocean 
as uh, after your existence. So it's kind of like breaking down of layers into each other, I feel. Life is kind of strange. Certain moments you're blessed with creation, you can create. Certain moments you can't. Certain moments you find yourself pulled to it because it's important, you know. If we are a creature beyond language, then we need to find a system that is beyond uh, language. Literally, we need to treat ourselves beyond concepts, names, objects, images, you know. That's the crucial thing. When you see a human being, it's like there's an unknown presence. Nobody knows who that person becomes. And life is very fascinating because whatever experience you have, whatever, at the end, it comes down to some direction. That means like when you, when you live life, your attention is experienced with a dynamism where it accesses a rhythm where, how can I tell you, right now you can move your physical body. I'm telling you, you can move your inner realms. You can evoke them and be them. You could not be, be, be your inner realms. I'm saying you can... Your inner realms is like a private room where the conditions of life are not limited by sensory perception. So it's kind of like we're taking all these senses in as a human being, and then these senses are being processed, but as they are processed, <clears throat> there's this atmosphere or space they create where imagination and conscious visualization can occur. And for a long time, guys, you don't know, it was kind of hilarious. I was just sitting every day and I'm like, all right, let's see. Let's see what this mind is. Let's see what thoughts enter. I became super sensitive to what ideas emerged in my experience. And when you become that sensitive where you're noticing even the thought, then you notice that you get you get access to this mic. I I would I've kind of some <laughs> I've called it hyper alertness. Okay, this hyper alertness I've in my own life I've had it since my childhood, but it's not something that is individual to DNA. It's how free the attention feels to itself, and when I say free, it it means it, it how much it abides by a sort of decency resonance. That means in this world, <clears throat> they're making success be a complex process and complex processes test and change the character of the person. If life was in a, the success was very simple, if success was designed in a system that was very simple, what would I say? Like, how would I say it? Like it, like it would be literally much of a civil society, much easier to kind of like be civilized. You see, most human beings are being violent because they don't have resources. This, my view is that when human beings have resources, they in some sense want to explore their mind. So it's like when you kind of like imagine robots came and took all our jobs and we're like, yo, what, what does the human being do? Robots are doing everything, you know? <clears throat> Even let's say we have the first robot, a like artificial, AI, not like, I don't know, conscious AI that draws a painting, you know? <laughs> It's like, here's the thing, programmers better when they, when they program super intelligence in the year 2050, they better put an honesty program. So the ro imagine we create a robot that lies to us, that would be the most hilarious thing, you know. <clears throat> I feel my attention moves without interruption. But communication, due to the nature of the body with its with, with the inhalation and exhalation, is rhythmic. <clears throat> so, due to the nature of our body being rhythmic through the inhale and exhale, like sea shore, like sea ocean waves. So it means whatever image we get, we're constantly seeing it in two modes. So the so the so I would say the human body is designed 
as a tool to work with duality. So duality shouldn't be feared, it should just be seen as a sort of mode of perception. You know, the good and the bad. You know, the beautiful and the ugly. You know, the truth and the illusion. You see? Guys, something um, I should tell people, I, usually I have this habit of like listening to like lectures, just random lectures when I'm kind of like, not even, I'm not talking about my own, just lectures online. And what I do is sometimes I go open another tab and I go to YouTube and I find my favorite song or whatever, and I play it while that thing's being played, you know, and then it's kind of like, or whatever song, you know. <clears throat> I feel that uh, we are <clears throat> temporal when we are animate and we are eternal when we are inanimate. So this is why I feel the mind's pure presence is non-dual. So any human being that has suddenly experienced a simple silence and back to the moment where you're just, you're just a physical object in space, like you just notice just the simple presence of the moment, you'll know when your mind calms down, when the ripple and the last ripple of your pond, uh, the, uh, the pond of your mind settles, you, uh, you will know. That's what I'm saying. Like I'm not here telling people uh, instructional things. I'm telling you it's all experiential. You're the pilot. You're, you have always been the pilot from the beginning. And you're one day going to realize that uh, there was never any other teacher than how your whole moment of being was being. That is the ultimate teacher. And that becomes a, a, a state. Literally, if somebody came and talked to you, you would just watch. Literally, there is no, there is literally, it's like even if phenomena moves, you're still watching. I think the <clears throat> idea of the young soul and the old soul, the traditional spiritualism in some sense entertained, that idea of the young soul, the old soul is not afraid of space. The young soul is empty, emptiness. The old soul is not afraid of emptiness. The young soul is. Why? Because energy has been uh, allowed. Something, you, we, we are kind of like, you know what it is? It's like, you see it in some movies, the guy and says like it was in The Godfather. <laughs> Or something the guy does a favor and then he will call upon you to do a favor you know because he does a favor for you and calls upon you to when the time comes to show your loyalty godfather style you know <laughs> so anyways what does that mean that means it's like we get engaged in something that it's like you're born you're given something you're gifted something you're gifted existence consciousness of existence that's no little thing that's a hyper achievement regardless of any context you see timeless or time in time <clears throat> I feel eventually the person at first their inner realms and outer realms are separate but when they truly go into their inner realms they realize experience is a field Every experience you've had, your mind, it's a field. Like right now, people are thinking, we are thinking we're people, but behind our eyes, we're a field of being. And this whole field of being, the more it, the, the, the more it realizes um, its separation from matter, the more it also realizes its unity. So in this life, when you step out of duality, you become, I, I say, you enter the silence of the pure lands. And when you reach that state, when, you've re when you enter the silence of the pure lands, you are just waiting for the earth to evoke you. 
then you kind of got the guy in mind speaks to you and you you go do whatever you're meant to you see because then the sages would say you have two you could do two things in life <laughs> and, they were, and somebody was like what what are those two things the sage is said long ago and the sage was like you can either trust life or distrust it any moment of your life your skill there is a, in, definitely a correlation with skill and trust I am telling you when you trust your experience when you it, it's like a lion roaring do you know your skill is not based on what you want, it's based on what's there. The energy is direct, the energy is not assumed. Hope is like assuming better energy. You know what I mean? <laughs> hope is cute, but in, in the, the general, and in, in some sense, sees it's not about hope, it's about which person in the battlefield sees quicker the known variables and the unknown variables of the situation. That means literally like you can quickly go in a room looking for your phone, look everywhere and see, your phone's not there, you're like, all right, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> so it's like literally in any moment of time, you can literally scan your ideological landscape. You can, uh, you can literally observe it. Like, a, you know how those old school radar scans, you know, they would kind of show these, uh, they would show like the environment. I'm telling you, your mind is not an object. So, and if you, when you look at it, it's like, what do people dislike? They're like, don't treat me like an object. You know, like you see that in this whole, like, what is it? Uh, these political correctness compilations on you. <laughs> I feel it's too dynamic to define. And it is too visible to not define at all. Like, do you see what I mean? We're kind of stuck in a balance. Right now, what is health? Like literally, think about it. Room temperature. Your biology has a room temperature. Check, think about it, right? So literally, if the room becomes too hot, you suffer. If the room becomes too cold, you suffer. And I feel reality is one of these things. If you become too, uh, just the whole, uh, just too omnipresent, you, you may suffer, but the suffering, you don't feel it as that. You feel it in your individual life. I, I, I think the, 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 an efficient approach is that trust only comes when you see it for yourself. Anything and skill is only evoked when you trust yourself. Trust means you want to see more of, you want to see how you do something in this life. That's trust. You know, this world... Uh, I'm telling you, even though we think we're, we're a great civilization, but I'm telling you, it's a fax, fax machine civilization. And people are going to be like, what's a fax machine, Mr. And I'll be like, exactly, that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's too old, what's going on. The systems haven't updated. Our computer interface, interface has, but our systems, are, you know, you know how many new gadgets are arising, but you know how many little ideas on the overall structure of civilization and a collective community. After, like after some point, you're like, for how long is this kind of uh, airport of, uh, like, like how would I say it? It's every person is living a life, but they, they only get to see it through their eyes.
Guys, check this out. Uh, there's this quote by someone named El Ghazali. Uh, this man says, the question of divine knowledge, this person says, this question, the question of divine knowledge is so deep that it is really known only to those who have it. There's also this quote by Kabir, he says, lift the, way, the veil that obscures the heart, and there you will find what you're looking for. That means, you might not believe it, but a lot of suffering, it's, there's an intellect, there's an uh, ideological component to it, but there's also an emotional contentment component to it, as if there needs to be a certain stability, there needs to be a sort of room temperature for the soul, you know. Room temperature of how reality is happening. This is why I'm saying every person, your style as a human being is literally you finding your own pace where your intelligence works at its most efficient potential. Every person is, it's like the mind is like an instrument. It can be played in a thousand ways, you know. So it's up to you to choose. So free will can be seen in escape where in a situation where the options are limited or it can be seen in a mindset where options are endless. Sometimes when I see a problem, I think about it, how would, would this be a problem if I was, for example, an eternal being right now? And I would suddenly see all the physical desire leave. Just in that moment, in that mindset. Or there's certain moments where I'm in like this still silent, silent sitting kind of moment. And it's like, in that moment, I think, is it all just eternity? And I'm like, no, the temporary becomes beautiful. And it's always like, if, if you are looking for something, there will always be a simulation feeling going on to the world. But if you somehow come abide by your true nature, as Sri Ramana Maharshi suggests, then there is something incredible. Rumi says there is a force within that gives you life. Seek that. There we go. Even Rumi's saying it. Guys, I'm just going to go into a Sufi quote, um, like Su Sufi quote, a quote tunnel. That's the segment of the show where I just read a bunch of quotes, you know. <laughs> Rumi says, when you do things from your soul, you feel a river moving in you, a joy. That's true. It becomes, you get access to rhythmic bliss, which is pretty much the same as such in Ananda, but uh, with more freedom to move. Uh, Rumi says, by God, when you see your beauty, you will be the idol of yourself. You will be the idol of yourself. Do you see how, like, multidimensional that sentence is? When you see your beauty, you will be the idol of yourself. That means you will be your own role model, or you will, in some sense, be your object of your own worship. Worship, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Rumi says, all love... All loves are a bridge to divine love, yet those who have not had a taste of it do not know. Rumi says, let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. It will not lead you astray. Lao Tzu is somehow in this quote. <laughs> We're bringing Chinese philosopher into this, you know, in the middle of these Sufi Dervish quotes, you know. At the center of your being, you have the answer. You know who you are and you know what you want. Lao Tzu says this. That means you know. And it's an incredible way of saying what's the answer to all questions and the answer comes from within. Somebody said that to me in, in my life. Life is really, really fascinating. It, it, it can become multidimensional in an instant. Rumi says, <clears throat> oh, Farid al-Din Attar, another Sufi mystic, he says, let love lead your soul. Make it a place to retire to, a kind of monastery cave, a retreat for the deepest core of your being. al 
Suhra Bardi says, if words come out of the heart, they will enter the heart. But if they come from the tongue, they will not pass beyond the ears. I have been a seeker and I still am. This is Romy saying this now. I've been a seeker and I still am, but I stopped asking the books and the stars. I started listening to the teaching of my own, of my soul. Yeah. You know, some souls get offended, you know, when they think they are so. <laughs> Rumi says, God writes spiritual mysteries on our heart where they wait silently for discovery. Guys, it's kind of intense because there was, um, there was, uh, in, in, for example, in certain holy books, there's a certain prophet, for example, and there was a passage that said something like the heart of the prophet there were gates. There were gates in the heart of the prophet. <clears throat> and in some sense, there was this idea. Where your inner eyes have different dimensions to it. You know, something like that. Rumi says the only rest comes when you're alone with God. Uh, let's see what else is there. Why, uh, Rumi says, why are you knocking at every other door? Go knock at the door of your own heart. That means get to know your intelligence while you're alive. Uh, Rumi says your heart is the size of an ocean. Go find yourself in its hidden depths. That's pretty much Rumi saying. It's like, yo, man, you, you, you know. Uh, I'm busy. <laughs> Rumi says, come inside the heart's house. There is peace and solace there. Rabia al-Basri says, the lover of God will cry and weep until he finds rest in the beloved's embrace. Guys, it's very fascinating. Most human beings, their metaphysics, it's like them dissolving into something. Isn't it incredible? There's a sort of dissolution component to feeling like the experience is next level. Uh, Hafez says, a Sufi, very notable Sufi, he says, for a day, just for one day, talk about that which disturbs no one and bring some peace into your beautiful eyes. Rumi says, this, and guys, I think I'm going to stop here. The Rumi says, the universe is not outside of you. Look inside yourself. Uh, everything that you want, you already are. Just check that out. Just think about this, guys. Right now, if somebody says that idea, every person listening to me right now, that idea you have of yourself, okay? If I tell you where it is, it's like hovering in some uh, subjective void. It's kind of like realizing you are simultaneously being your idea of self and every idea you have had on everything. You are being the whole moments and the whole mind's activity. So technically desire is like a, a, a singular dimension is, tr is trying to devour the dualistic dimension and it never can. I think we have we don't have to fear nature because fear is never efficient. It's like doesn't work anywhere. It doesn't help any anyone. When you realize that, you kind of say, "All right, let me let me be that person that just like I don't need certain words in, in, in my arsenal. I don't need certain, for example, uh, views."
we are not, we don't just have people living among us. We have ideology living among us. And then ide one ideology can become a bunch of people's mind or all those people can individually go and become masters of their inner realms and then find the contentment to learn from the outer realms. There's something that I think really switches the karma of the person and it is when they find the moment they're meant for. And if you are a person who's too fast running for the future, you will miss out. So it's kind of like after some point, the person feels they. it's kind of like looking at your mind and feeling at first you see nothing there. Then you are running out to other minds, you know. And then suddenly one mind comes and get, get puts a mirror in front of you. And you suddenly realize that if you went back, your mind is an endless uh, treasure house of complexity. And it's only through trust that I feel the higher dimensions open up, the reality advances. Evolution is kind of saying we found trust in something new. The ape was like, oh gosh, I can't take the smell of dirt anymore. And suddenly we were on our two legs, you know. <laughs> So guys, uh, I honestly feel like I should end the uh, like I I should end the talk here. But if anybody has a question or anybody wants me to speak more about something, like uh, I'm gonna take a one minute breather and you guys share if you feel make this more audience interactive. You know. How would the species react if there was no direction to space, that the mind was always and forever content, your mind is already in heaven, it is the body that is journeying. So the body that is journeying The question that I can best though is what after the game of objects? <clears throat> what happens after we finish playing that game? And what happens after we finish existing even playing the game of the immortal subject? You know, let's say human beings in the future, they all become kind of robotic. There's no human body, but we're a bunch of robots acting human. Uh, uh, we're a bunch of uh, robots acting human because we were humans that literally replaced our body parts for robots. That's the danger of a technological society. It can take you to, an, to a dimension where you're not designed for, and then it can uh, make you collapse.
I never completely shared this idea, but uh, there's a character I've made in one of my science fiction novels. It's pretty much this character that appears when there is something out of random. And when it appears, this character is the kind of world breaker, the apocalypse breaker. And it's this sort of kind of like creature, kind of like statue looking like creature that appears. And from its eyes, there's endless tears. But when from one of its eyes, one part of the face of this, this character is smiling, the other part of the face of the being is completely in terror, in terror and chaos. So it's like the facial expression on the right side of the, uh, if that you drew a vertical line, like from the center of the character, the right side of the body was like in complete joy and bliss and eternal. It was ha experiencing tears of joy. And the other side was experiencing a facial expression of utter terror, sadness, sorrow, and anguish. And they were coming tears of sorrow. So literally, it's a character in my book where from one of its eyes, there's endless tears of sorrow and chaos and uh, like the end of all phenomena. And from its right eye, it's all the tears of joy and all this. The character was a metaphor for the edge of consciousness to be the equal total observance and acknowledgement of chaos and order. For how long will the weather define our mind? Will the inner weather, the, the way the biology is defined, the intelligence? You know, it may be something incredible. That if we find a way that if we find that we exist in a system that is beyond the sensory, then the method to utilize or acknowledge that system has to be beyond the sensory. So pretty much the challenge is if there is another dimension, its access point has to be beyond sensory. So that means technically you need a vehicle to get to the higher dimensions. Now what that vehicle would be, would I think come, come from a firm resolution on the objective realm. You should be a being that your attention doesn't suddenly come to the objective realms. Your objective realms are satisfied, you're content. And your subjective realms, you will discover their formlessness. That means it's kind of fascinating. Thoughts come and go, and so do the cells of the body, you know? You know, guys, it's kind of like this very, it's, it's going to be the next uh, great, it's going to be like the first philosophical question of the cyberspace age. That I feel when I'm, I, when I'm, might be like, I don't know, maybe in 20 years I may experience its, its pioneered kind of perfection. But anyways, anyways. I think suffering is not a bad thing because I think we can't know, we don't know enough to know how we are suffering. We know that we, we feel uncomfortable and we know that that is due to the conditions of the body. So it's as if like the most important, one of the most important technologies that every, I don't know how the whole, like there should be a global petition signed by every human being in the world being like, okay, we need incredible investments Okay, in a technology that can make through liquid, through liquid technology, an, all, an ultimate food. I feel that is the most important thing for us to create. 
to find ways to have the body become energized. And even though there's a correlation with the free will of the person, it's like you can have the most amount of energy, but if you have no direction in life, you know, you, you in some sense, it's like you're just like a statue of energy. Like, no, there's no point to that. You know, that means it's better to do something in this life, to move around and engage it, than in some sense just to watch it. I will tell you this, but mysticism is like a totally different context where the mystic had walked around enough, you know, in the illusion. You take off the simulation just like you take off your shoes, you know. <laughs> you no longer walk in the shoes of an idea. You free yourself from the shackles of language that never existed. You return to the experiencer. And there, there is, 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 is an abode. It's the pure lands. And once you go into the pure lands and experience the pure lands, you won't fear life. And when you don't fear life, then there comes the guy in the, the ears of nature open. Or, uh, the, nature opens your ears and you suddenly get ego vision intu intuitions. So right now, some people are like experiencing... For example, like synchronicity or whatever, Jungian synchronicity seems to be still afloat in uh, atmospheres in, certain, in modern cultures. But this Jungian synchronicity, like the person feeling they're seeing a certain number and a certain correlation, this is all because you, some, some, you have experienced something that has caused a sort of wilderness to domino effect in the psychology and need to ask the ultimate question. That means there could be ways that there could be ways you you want things from life that you don't even consciously know. You know, so many things are just accepted into what they are, you know. And when we realize we're in a space-time continuum, we're literally, if I say, <coughs> excuse me, let me, let me say it, like, let me, I was looking at my old notes and I realized I had created a word like years ago. And the word was the word R-E-M-I-N-D-E-A-D, -E -E remind dead. You know, this is the thing. And this was my definition of it. This is what I had wrote. So that's the word, guys, reminded, which means reminded of death and life's temporal nature, you know. So imagine this word right now I, uh, I've shared here. This word is something that people, I can have an opinion on what it means and endless people can have an opinion. So technically, it's all about how long we endure to see what happens. That is life. On some level, I was like, we are fragments in a cosmic landscape and we're wondering about what's the meaning of life. Are we, are we beyond life? Are we not? It, it, after some point, you just kind of see that we, there are dimensions beyond language, therefore no longer dualistic frameworks. So when you're no longer a dualistical, uh, dualistical, a dualistic entity, what are you? You are pure presence. Pure presence is inseparable from the mind. So awareness becomes the ultimate self. You realize your awareness is the self of yourself. When you find contentment with that awareness, then after that, if you still need words and if you still have questions, then I'd be surprised if you ever experienced it at all. You know, Because there's something about nature that it doesn't speak uh, a sort of linear, uh, it doesn't speak with an alphabet, it speaks in what is evoked in the moment, what happens in the moment. It's like before the human being was doing a ceremony, the all of nature was awakening to some sort of behavioral pattern. 
It's as if light is shined on this rock and all the creatures raise their hands suddenly there. Suddenly the light passes, their hands come down. And that's just the whole thing, that when light comes, we, life is there, reality is there. When light is not there, it's as if like there's still life there, but it, the reality isn't there. So I don't know, guys, you know, life's arrow, it is, I feel it's going towards the inconceivable. There's this quote I'm going to read, it's from Khalil Gibran, simply because it has an air, like an arrow imagery in it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Guys, this poem is by Khalil Gibran, this Lebanese uh, incredible poet. He says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. That means it's, it's kind of like a dimension of your existence. You gotta stand your ground, the bow has to be stabled. You know, and you gotta use the strength the earth has given you, you know? <laughs> so you find stability like a bow but then a dimension of your intelligence pierces like an arrow you know we we in some sense become creatures we human beings have two wings but these wings exist in their minds and one is of complexity and one is of simplicity so we, uh, we literally if we can balance simplicity and complexity in the moment the simultaneous witness of both of them we you can literally fly into a new dimensional conception it's kind of saying like right now, because we are identified in an individual conscious context, we're thinking, all right, so we're a body and an extraterrestrial, like it, 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 it should be like a body, but we don't consider an extraterrestrial being either like in another the parallel dimension, right? Like Fermi in Fermi's paradox where Fermi's saying, where, where is everybody? Where, where are all the aliens? You know, that's what Fermi is saying, you know? And so he's like, it's kind of weird because it, the universe has been so been alive so long, but in some sense, there's no nothing here. There's nothing there. So guys, I found this interesting passage from Khalil Gibran on good and evil. And I'm going to read this and I think I'm going to end off like a kind of the fuel's running out for this talk. I'm getting really exhausted. Uh, <laughs> Khalil Gibran says of, uh, on, so it's, he's talking about good, good, good and evil and he says of the good in you, I can speak, but not of the evil. For what is evil but good tortured by its own hunger and thirst? Warily, when good is hungry, it seeks food even in dark caves, and when it thirsts, it drinks even of dead waters. You are good when you are one with yourself. 
Yet when you are not one with yourself, you are not evil. For a divided house is not a den of thieves, it is only a divided house. And a ship without rudder, uh, without rudder may wander aimlessly among perilous isles, yet sink not to the bottom. You are good when you strive to give of yourself. Yet you are not evil when you seek gain for yourself. For when you strive for gain, you are but a root that clings to the earth and sucks at her breast. Surely the fruit cannot say to the root, Be like me, ripe and full, and ever giving of your abundance. For to the fruit, giving is a need, as receiving is a need to the root. You are good when you are fully awake in your speech. Yet you are not evil when you sleep while your tongue staggers without purpose. And even stumbling speech may strengthen a weak tongue. You are good when you walk to your goal firmly and with bold steps, yet you are not evil when you go thither limping. Even those who limp go not backward, but you who are strong and swift, see that you do not limp before the lame, deeming it kindness. You are good in countless ways, and you are not evil when you are not good. You are only loitering and sluggard. Pity that the stags cannot teach swiftness to the turtles. In your longing for your giant self lies your goodness, and that longing is in all of you. But in some of you, that longing is a torrent rushing with might to the sea, carrying the secrets of the hillsides and the songs of the forest, and in others it is a flat stream that loses itself in angles and bends and lingers before it reaches the shore. But let not... But let not him who longs much say to him who longs little, Wherefore are you slow and halting? For the truly good ask not the naked, where is your garment? Nor the houseless, uh, in quotation says, what has befallen your house? I think what he's saying is that the decency of our humanity even transcends all the ways we're identifying as an individual in the moment. And when we get a sense of what the mind is, it's kind of projective. So we become a moment of attention prior to the definition. We study the design of the moment and then wonder about how the design is moving. You know, something of the sort. Anyways, guys. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to open it up to Q&A, guys, for 10 minutes. If anybody has a question, feel free to share. If not, uh, thanks for listening so far. And fear not. Life is literally not designed for fear. It's designed for exploration. And exploration has unknown variables, so the unknown can't literally be feared because you, you're, what are you fearing? It's unknown. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so guys, anybody has a question, they can share in the chat section.
Guys, I'm going to read this other quote from Khalil Gibran. It's about self-knowledge. He says, Your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and the nights, but your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge. You would know in words that which you have always known in thought. You would touch with your fingers the naked body of your dreams. And it is well you should. The hidden wellspring of your soul must, must needs rise and run, murmuring to the sea. So guys, the person's put two words here, I don't know, I think it's, let me see, the hidden one spring of your soul must needs. Let's say the hidden wellspring of your soul must rise and run murmuring to the sea, and the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes. And let there be no scales to weigh your unknown treasure, and seek not the depths of your knowledge with the with staff or sounding line, for self is a sea boundless and measureless. Measureless, yeah. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Guys, I'm going to share this poem in the chat section. <clears throat> That's the thing. We think we are incomplete because of our outer condition of our outer realms but in our inner realms it's like what after completion we should think of af completion after you know the after completion like the you know aftermath but that <laughs> all right all right guys all right guys thanks <coughs> excuse me thanks for tuning in and uh let me see what's one last thing I can say. If you are a static being, the meaning was there before it ever moved. If you're a dynamic being, the meaning is in the making and infinite speed is the way. To see an advanced civilization is the greatest glory of the lifetime. I'll leave you with that. Thanks, guys. Much blessings and awesome.